Hey, Tommy. Hey. Oh, hey, Remy. How's it going? Good, and you? Pretty good. We technically, I think, only have an hour because I'm pretty sure that the workflow group uses the exact same Zoom call at that uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern. So I have a hot stop at uh, 10. Uh... PST anyway. So. Yeah, well, I got to eat lunch. So yeah, it's all important stuff. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, so let's see who's going to join. Did you have a chance to see the video? Or? No, unfortunately, I did not. I apologize. I, I just all saw right. it this morning and I haven't had a chance to actually run it. So H how long is the video, by the way? Three minutes. Well, I, can, I can do it live. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah let, let's, let's let people join first and then we'll do that. Just out of curiosity, did you um, did you implement a, a ping service like I described here? Uh, yeah, uh, it's just I need to check the the ping is not exactly the same. Uh, <coughs> I I have a ping service and a cat service, which I can call the way I want. So I call it Garfield, uh, <laughs> and then basically every fifteen seconds the cat sends an event. Of like an action, like uh, sleeping, sitting, uh, yawning, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I also did the gateway. So but I, I, I can. While we wait, I can show you what I did, and I can restart if uh, if someone joins. Yeah, I don't mind repeating later. Yeah, go go ahead and go ahead and start. We can always redo it again. It's only three minutes. Uh, let me yeah. stop sharing. Stop sharing. There we go. Need to have no. ah, connect it. That's all. Okay, share. Uh, I'll find one sec. Proximity. Okay, perfect. Okay, and then I have to go. I have like those uh, Macs with like a broken keyboard. It's super annoying. Uh, Okay, you see my screen? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> um, basically I have three services, the gateway, Garfield and the ping service. So they all are on, uh, you see here the URL. Mm -hmm. um, so I just connect them on several ports. Uh, in the discovery, you basically see the slash service. It's just a display of slash services. So Garfield has like, as so uh, this and all those type events. Uh, correct me whenever I say wrong things about like the uh, words. I think I need to reread the spec to get every word perfect. Uh, then the ping service is basically with this source and is sending this event. Mm -hmm. So from this UI, I can basically subscribe. When I subscribe here, uh, so the ping is every five seconds. So you can see that I start receiving the the ping events cool i can also subscribe to garfield and in that case uh we'll start receiving so ping is every five seconds while garfield is every 15 so in uh, the next five seconds we should see a garfield here it's excellent hitting. uh so that's nice but for me it's just like one part uh now i have a gateway uh, which is intermediary. Right now, he has nothing. Like in the discovery, you can see it's empty. But I want the gateway to start proxy and uh, like being the intermediary of Garfield. So I'm going to ask it to connect to Garfield. So now you can see that in the discovery, I have this. So if I subscribe to the gateway, so now like the little uh, the green thing is just to show that I was subscribing to this. So I should see the events uh, arising here uh, within the 15 seconds. So you see here one event. Of course, if 
as a consumer, I subscribe to both, then in the next 15 seconds, we will see a double event because I will receive it from the gateway and also from the Garfield service. So here, that's why you will see a double one. So just to be clear, you said you subscribe to the gateway. What you really mean is you're subscribing to the gateway's version of the Garfield service, right? Yeah, like, yeah. So okay. basically, it's like I'm calling this. Um, so I did some simplification because uh, it's still quite a bit of work <laughs> to implement all that and do the UI. Uh, but um, like, I, I didn't send the subscription config. So like, and I raised some questions by doing like, by doing that, even on the SDK side, uh, the way we emit uh, the, the event. So I did publish everything on GitHub and my goal is also like to open the discussion to understand. So like in that gateway, I can also connect to ping and then suddenly, so you see the gateway who will expose basically those two uh, sources and send events from both. And like it allows me my scenario is basically Garfield or Ping will be GitHub and uh, like other of our provider. My gateway will be like a Nuxeo gateway. And so my employee will go to the gateway, like my teams, <coughs> and they don't care about how the gateway connects to Garfield basically, or GitHub or thing like that. And Just out of curiosity, when you subscribe to the gateway's version of Garfield, is the URL pointing to Garfield or is it from, from the client's perspective, is the URL pointing to the gateway or is it pointing to the real Garfield? To the gateway directly. Okay, because cool. <clears throat> like I want to be able to have network uh, isolation between. Mm -hmm. So, and like this gateway should, uh, like there is way more feature that I should add. I was just uh, staying at like the simple uh, first uh, level. Um, but <clears throat> so when you connect, it automatically subscribe to the service for now without filter. So it's already start to proxy, even if no one has subscribed uh, to the service yet. So like I don't do a cleaver matching to understand if I need to subscribe in advance or not. Uh, but like, and you see, as soon as I disconnect, it will remove from uh, the discovery service. And then now I disconnect the two of them. So the gateway is not doing anything anymore. And then uh, I can still see my two services. So in your, in your case, the, the, the connect disconnect is making it so the gateway is just aware of the service. Yeah, exactly. It's available. Okay, you got it. Okay. So this part is basically an API uh, that is not in the spec. It's like a proxies, what I call. That is the API I see for the Cloud Events Gateway. Mm -hmm. Just to say, okay, like go and discover this service for me and just start proxying it. And same thing for every. So whenever you click connect, that's where normally if I had a schema on a subscribe uh, subscription configuration, I will pop like a form that for you to fill what you have to fill and to subscribe. But um, yeah, I just want to, like, yeah, that's a sim a simplification of uh, all case, but it was to have something uh, concrete to work on. Yeah. No, th this is cool. I like it a lot. So, so let me ask you some questions as you're coding this up. Um, since your UI thingy here can subscribe to all three things, yeah. um, did you have to put in any specialized code depending on what you subscribe to, or is the subscribe hundred percent generic and only use metadata from the discovery endpoint? So it's, uh, um, only use for now, I just put the URL and I consider that the slash subscription because the subscription API. Like there is a few things that uh, are weird in my opinion is we put for now the API of the subscription is about posting on a slash subscription endpoints. But yet on every service, we put the URL of the subscription URL. So in fact, it's the same for every service when you're in the discovery panel. So that's like small stuff, um, but it's, I was- can, 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 you, can you repeat that one more time? You lost me. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Like I can probably show a bit of the code before it might uh, explain what I do. So the UI basically talks to this uh, service where it's like just a demo to get like all the events because as inside the UI, I cannot expose a port to get the, uh, the events. So this is a small service for the UI to be able to subscribe and subscribe and, uh, and do that. And for the rest, when you subscribe, inside so this button uh, that is here 
Mm -hmm. So let's say I click subscribe. I will basically end up here sending a subscribe with the URL I want to subscribe, and it will go to uh, this do a post on that subscription URL slash subscription with like the thing to be able to retrieve all the, the events. And then it will keep it inside the service. So I store it in like the events buffer and the UI is basically for now just pulling because like I didn't have the time to do a full uh, web socket, but it's pulling from this endpoint to get the latest uh, events every time. So that's, <laughs> But that's using the endpoint like subscription here, you can see. So that's the spec definition of the subscription. But okay, well, I wanna make sure I understand though, because every, every service in the discovery endpoint should have a unique URL that you're sending the subscribe to. Yeah, right? that's why the URL is coming from the body. So basically, uh, if you look here, <clears throat> uh, in a network, I think it would be great. So when I unsubscribe, when I subscribe, I give him the URL of the service uh, here. So I say, okay, I want to subscribe to this service URL. So we will go to that, do slash discover. I, I, on that one, I do agree it's a shortcut because it should do the slash discover. Um, it's like slash service to get the subscription URL. But basically as if you look every time the subscription URL for me is the URL slash subscriptions. Okay, so you, okay so, you, so you cheat because you know you're talking to yourself. Yeah, on that one, yeah. Like if okay. I was not, then I will do the, like, in fact, I would use here I because I have also that data. So I'm sorry to, it's uh, when I click. So if I click here, what I'm sending is in fact, uh, you can see the response. I have the full, uh, I think preview is better. You have the full uh, stuff with the subscription URL. So exactly. I could yeah. I could use that. So it's just, I do agree, I cheated a bit because uh, I finished yesterday at 1 a.m. So it was a bit. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> I, no, because my question was, because the reason I asked that question was because I wanted to make sure that, sure, your implementation may choose to cheat because you know you're talking to yourself and whatever, but I wanted to make sure that there wasn't something missing in the specification so that you could have done it through discovery as opposed to shortcut and sheets. Yeah, but like my shortcut is really uh, a quick sheet. It's like I could almost fix it in a few secs because uh, right now I'm taking the URL of the service that I display here. Why basically uh, the only thing I have to do is to take the URL that is shown in this panel. Yep. So it's really quick. But what I was saying is more um, like, uh, I think when I, uh, I'm gonna subscribe to this one, if I sub connect those two. So now I have like the gateway with like the two, uh, two type. And here you will see that the subscription URL will end up being, uh, yeah, I just, no, I didn't overwrite because it should uh, be, that's where basically I should override the subscription URL to say mm -hmm. that now it's a gateway, it's not the original service. Right. And that's basically what I do because my shortcut is uh, enabling that by just, uh, by, because when I click on that, it's gonna call the right URL. So that's okay. just, I need to override this part, but it was not really in part of the spec because it's more part of the service that I call uh, gateway, uh, which is basically, uh, I know this one, it's in the discovery. But what I really noticed also is the current SDK doesn't match, doesn't fit well with description and discovery because the way you send um, the events, once you emit the event, you need to already know what is your current subscription to send to the current subscriptions. And the way the SDK was designed, I don't think it is a great match for that. So I need to talk with the SDK people if we think that this case is the right case, if I understood the thing correctly. Um, and what I wanted to show you is... So I want to make sure I understand yeah. that because um, Scott's on the call. Um, when you say the SDK, do you mean specifically the JavaScript or TypeScript SDK or do you mean all SDKs probably have the same problem? Um, I cannot talk for the other SDK. What happened is um, I had to do 
when I emit. So I all like the dummy service are here. So basically I have my ping service is just creating. So that's just to register the way I was showing you. It allows you to create uh, easy discovery service. Mm -hmm. But then I just create this new cloud event. But I had to create the cloud event emitter because in fact, the way the SDK was, I was not able to plug to the uh, emission of the events. So in fact, then this thing will call, and that's why I created a, I created a emitter where basically I say, okay, emit me this cloud event. And then it will emit as an event so then my subscription service can subscribe to this uh, type of events to redistribute it to all its subscription. Because if you don't do that, then you only consider it's a, a static emission. You only emit to one uh, endpoint. So uh, hmm. I hope I'm clear. Maybe I'm not. But S Scott, does that make sense to you? And do you think the Golang SDK would have a similar issue? Uh, Golang doesn't have that issue. Okay. Because basically, whenever, like, when you when you receive a like that's, but the thing I had to code inside the subscription service is you have to go through all your subscriptions. If they match uh, the filtering, to push the event to them. And so you end up doing several requests when you emit, uh, depending on how many subscription you have in your service. Sorry, wait, I, maybe I missed what the, what the problem is. So, um, did, did you uh, see the demo, uh, by the way, Scott? Or? I, I'm, I came in about 10 minutes late. I uh, forgot about this meeting because Dougie Doug did not put it on the calendar. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So, it's in the note though. So I did, I did at least do something, just not enough. <laughs> so uh, basically I oh, did yeah, a yeah. UI. What was True. the issue with the SDK? The way it emits the, um, the, the events were not pluggable, it seems to me. Uh, so you cannot implement the subscription API uh, nicely because uh, you have no way to to connect to it, to redistribute to all your subscriptions. Mm. So uh, this one is express. And... I see. So in, in Go, in the Go SDK, you can set up this the client and stuff, but you can change what the target is, if that's the question. Yeah, but the subscription API create multiple targets because you have multiple subscriptions. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. You so, have to send them one at a time. <laughs> that's yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's, there's no magic there. Right? Like, but it was just like, um, so I need to find, uh, because I, I don't think the example are good enough. Yeah, I can come back to that. I, I suppose um, if I try to go too much in the deep there, and I will lose uh, everyone. But uh, if you haven't seen Scott, I can reshow quickly this. The, this I, I, I did see this, yeah. Okay, so I, you're I good. This. Um, so the nice thing is like this uh, UI could be plugged almost uh, everywhere. So I just need to add like uh, something to add new services and then you can define your own service and you can play around to see the, the events and. Uh, and the discovery. The one thing in the in the subscription spec I didn't like and I didn't implement was I, I think in the spec it says you have to use a query parameter to get the subscription ID. So yeah, I changed that. I, I my PRM changes that last night. I did not like that at all. <laughs> yeah, it's it's I didn't implement that because I was like, this is garbage. I'm not doing it. Yeah, for me, I implemented, uh, to be honest, this way. Uh, I propose also like a refactor just to say it should be this way. We've like, you create a new subscription, you get the list of subscription, you get yep. one. Right. So I did implement this way because uh, like, yeah, it was not making sense to to use the old endpoint because like you are, you are the one specifying the ID or stuff like that where uh, I don't think it should be 
So yeah, I this is basically that. what I implemented too. Okay. <laughs> so maybe we should merge that. Uh, when yeah, because there's is... symmetry with the discovery API too. Like the other thing was um, in the open API in the schema, there is also something about proxy where basically it should not be like, it's not me as a client who should define the proxy the server will use. So I don't think it should be inside. Like if you look in the HTTP settings uh, here, there was like proxy credentials and proxy URL where I should not be able to define those. So yeah, I can stop sharing. Sorry, I didn't want to hijack the whole meeting, but... Um... Yeah. So, okay, let me do this. Since we only have 40 minutes left before we get kicked out. Want to see my quick demo? Oh yeah, sure, go for it. Okay. Cool. Okay. So I, I showed you the the ring buffer last time. Mm -hmm. So we'll set that up again. And if you don't remember, it's so service one downstreams to service two. So basically, like this is the resulting catalog of this service. And it's pulling from this middle service. And then the middle service is going to pull from the rightmost service. So uh, note C service outdated is here outdated. And before before we had epoch, uh, that outdated service would, would propagate the ring as a little bubble of uh, incorrect data. But now we have epoch and we can see that the outdated service that the middle server hosts out of its normal catalog has been replaced by the actual authority of that service. So cool, now it's steady, neat. Um, so that's just kind of proving that the epoch thing uh, works. So when you say the, I wanna make sure we're on the same page. So when you say the epoch thing works, is it because you assume that if you change any metadata about the service, you now own the service? Well, my assumption is that you don't change the metadata or the epoch if you're aggregating. Oh, or the epoch. Okay, yep. Okay, okay. cool. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, okay. So, uh, and then I was like, would it, wouldn't it be cool if this discovery service could actually you know, host itself? And so if you notice, it has a uh, Z, or sorry, uh, X, Y, and Z, but also this Discovery service from Met, Met Cloud Meta. Cloud Meta is just the stupid name that I invented for this thing. So I can curl the local host. Uh, and on port 80, and then look at services. And pipe this through the GPQ. And we see that we can look at this. So this, this is the particular service. And it is the subscription endpoint for this discovery service it directly. So we can cool. leverage that. Uh, over here, I'm gonna I'm gonna run a little wait, wait, go, wait, go, wait, go back go back for a sec. Let's see the output there. So it's interesting that so, so that queried the discovery endpoint entry but your your list of events is interesting um is that the is that the list of events that were generated or is that the list of events that you can get these are the lists of events that i can get i can subscribe to these i invented these right no, no, no. Oh, okay I, i'm sorry i just it, yeah that, that that that's correct it's just the way I, the way the text was written there it, 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 I thought it was the list of events as they were being generated so there was a live stream okay never mind i was the, the, the description threw me got it Never mind. I was just misreading it. Oh yeah, probably red herring with this, the stream. Um, so I have this little uh, little client program that's going to go and it's going to register on that particular host to this sockeye service, which is running here. And I'm going to do no filtering yet, and so we'll we'll see that happen. 
Uh, no, okay, so the only 8080 is running. And then I'm gonna run the client, make sure that Sockeye is visible. And so I get that uh, service subscribed. It has no content type, no data. It's just the uh, I subscribed. And now I can do the, the same demo over here where uh, middle service propagates the C and D services and they show up. That's neat. And then I can run the final service in the ring. And I should see changes over here on Sakai. Once it propagates, it propagates every 10 seconds for this particular demo. And so Sakai collates on subject and the subject happens to be the service that it's talking about because this particular event stream is about service entries in the discovery catalog. And so you can see when C was added and it was the outdated description and now it's it's been updated and it, the description is the correct one. And we also got, uh, we added D and A and B. All right. So that's basically my demo. I can, oh, oh, right, oh, sorry. Okay, wait, one, one, one change. Uh, so we'll shut this down. There's no storage on my, this, this thing. Uh, we will add the filtering. So I only want to see updated events. Oh, too much. And then we'll register here. And then we'll go and run, turn these down. So we should get no events until I start up this service and stuff starts get, getting propagated. So we'll just wait a second for that. Cool. So we only got one event because the filtering works and we get that one updated event from the internal discovery. So why I'm showing you this is we can get both push and pull for uh, catalog changes based on this because you can pull the, the endpoint or you could register, you could subscribe to it and get changes, which is all kind of cool. Very cool. Excellent. Okay, so let me, hold on a minute. Okay, so let, let's go back to here then. So you, you, both you guys showed really cool demos, but I'm trying to figure out is <clears throat> what pieces of those demos do we need to actually write down in this document for other people to implement? Or what do we need to do in order to get people to start sort of playing in part of this game, right? So for example, if, if I, I figure at a minimum, people will need to expose or register or let us know what their discovery endpoint is, which is why I was assuming everybody needs to add their own section down here. But do we need to formalize what people do with those endpoints in terms of what queries we expect them to do? Or should we leave it a little more free form? So for example, you guys both did something completely different with your discovery endpoints, right? Um, Scott, you got the circular thing, you do subscribe to it. Remy, you, you did a gateway thing going up to it. And maybe, maybe we should leave it completely free form so people can do completely different things and try to push the system. But what do you guys think is the bare minimum someone who wants to play in this game should be forced to implement? Is it just a discovery endpoint? Is it discovery endpoint? Discovery and subscription? subscription. <clears throat> yeah, discovery and subscription, because I think without it, it's, it's hard to demo something that is nice. So when you, okay, so obviously they need a discovery endpoint with a list of services in there, but you, then you said subscription, you mean subscription for each of those services, right? Well, I, I think the discovery endpoint, I, maybe one of the qualifications okay. is that the discovery endpoint hosts services that you can actually subscribe to. Yes, so the yes. subscription URL, but then that means you need to have a subscription API. The only issue there is like, uh, but it seems that uh, we are on the same page uh, with Scott is uh, we need to upgrade the subscription API because the current version is uh, 
honestly not good to implement. So yeah, we, I, we plus, huge plus one. Yep. So I'm sorry, I was just taking notes. Say that again. Like we need to validate the new change in the subscription API because we don't want people to uh, implement the current version of the subscription API. Like oh, you mean the, the query parameter thing, right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. There was, like the whole API was not correct. Like it was not resource based for the endpoints and. Uh, yep. So and honestly, even I I ignored it. <laughs> the query parameter. I let everybody came to the same conclusion. That's great. Yeah. So. <laughs> So hold on a minute. Let's and at this. least uh, that, let's try to enjoy the same way all together <laughs> by uh, following uh, a new one. Um, okay. So just so just a quick feedback. I mean, I uh, because even I started working on my demo, I was not able to finish it on time. Uh, I kind of don't agree that having discovery endpoints should be a minimum criteria because I, start, I, I was assuming the fact that there's already a discovery endpoint which is enlisting the subscription URL. So I started working on the second half. So does it really make sense to have that as a mandate? So when you say second half, elaborate on what you mean by the second half. Uh, the implementation of subscription manager and basically assuming that that URL is already available in the discovery endpoint. So you still need to connect the event producer with the consumer and that is the logic of subscription managers. I wanted to implement just the subscription API and basically have a messaging back and connect to it. So if you wanted to do just the subscription API, which I think, I agree with you, I think that's valid, then you would be responsible for figuring out how to register yourself with some discovery endpoint, correct? Yeah, I mean, I'm still assuming that there is a discovery service behind it. It's just I'm not implementing it as a part of the demo. <laughs> But the thing for me is like, because the next, uh, mine is still on the localhost, but uh, I saw that Scott is using uh, like uh, already a public endpoint. So we could all make them publish. And then to subscribe, we will need to have the discovery that works. So depending, for me, if you cut it or not, it's fine. Uh, it's just, it needs to be there, the endpoint, yeah, for yeah. us to be I able mean, to connect. For sure. yeah. Yeah, and one thing that why I was uh, implementing, the discovery service is in fact relying on the subscription service because the subscription service is the one defining the subscription URL and the subscription config. And that's where I started to have some uh, interdependency between all the spec in my implementation and I think it's normal but I, I was not sure it was part of the intent uh, originally. Yeah I think it does make sense so because you really need to have the URL that needs to be published as a part of your discovery uh, yeah. uh, response right so it does make sense to have the subscription manager or the implementation of the subscription API first before we start having a a response for the, for the discovery endpoint. So I'm sorry, Anish, I'm, I'm, I'm not following you. If you don't, if you only have the subscription manager API, mm -hmm. you have to have them accessible someplace or you have to have it. No, how no, are people going to find you if you don't have a discovery endpoint? No, no, I'm not, this, I'm not saying that we should not have it. I'm saying it should be as part two. So first you need to have the URL to which you can subscribe to. And then basically, then you would create a metadata, right? So implementation comes before metadata or the metadata comes before implementation. It's just the oh, okay. question of yeah. positioning it. Okay. Um, I don't have any, I don't, I was able to implement the discovery and the subscription APIs with no dependencies on either. But how do you feel the subscription URL and subscription config? I mean, that's probably because you already had the insight about what URL you want to subscribe to, right? I mean, but in a case where we don't have the information that what URL to subscribe to, in that case, the subscription API implementation should go first, right? Well, I think it, it, it seems to me this is just a choice and how you choose to implement yeah. it. But it seems to me, if you want to participate in the demo, if, you, if you're only going to do the subscription API, then you need to work with somebody to get your service registered with their discovery endpoint, or yeah. if you want both, you have to implement both. Yeah, correct. Right. So okay. the order doesn't really matter. I mean, just your oh, choice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Okay. Okay. So if that's the minimum people need to do just to participate, 
do we need to talk at all about uh, what do we do to actually test this out to make sure, for example, people can talk to the discovery service to do a subscription or should we just say, no, everybody sort of write their own client tester thingy and we want variations there to, to push the boundaries. What I was uh, thinking is maybe I can uh, also put the UI uh, like uh, even as a separate project because the UI is not uh, specific to TypeScript. So if we want to iterate on that to add more stuff, like I liked uh, the more detailed version of Scott. It's just uh, doing the UI it takes a few hours uh, <laughs> at least. So maybe if we just have a common... Uh, because it's agnostic to the technology. So the UI should be almost uh, a separate stuff that we can all rely on. No? Yeah, if, if you want to make your UI available for other people to to use, I think with the only thing that's missing is the ability for someone to then register their service with you through through the UI. Yeah, correct. Yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, I can see Sakai is just a, a quad events viewer. I, I, we use it for Knative mostly. Ah, okay. That's right. Like I, I, I didn't know the project. Uh, yeah, what I nothing to do with these. It's it just uh, presents cloud events in the UI. Okay. Because what I like with the one I did is like you really see the discovery. Like you have the discovery plus the subscription. Uh, so I wanted to display that. I, at first, I wanted to have a small maps of the service, uh, but uh, it was getting too late <laughs> to do the graph uh, part. So Scott, the ability to subscribe to the discovery endpoint itself to get changes. Um, do you want to make your uh, the, the metadata about the discovery service itself available so people can basically copy that and steal it if they want to spit out events for discovery endpoint? That way we have some consistency. Uh, yeah, it's it's all in. I'll, I'll paste the repo. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you. Hold on. Oh wait, that's not the real. That's your Sakai thing. There we go. Thank you. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Okay, so let's do this, Scott. I need to work on getting some like the the fake other supporting services up and running. I do have a version of this that's running in the Kubernetes cluster that you can subscribe to updates for it, but you don't get updates if you don't have a ring, right? Okay. If I, like on my side, I was proxying directly uh, without cache, so I didn't really had an issue with the epoch because in fact, whenever you query, it requires all the service, which wouldn't be sustainable in a, a full production environment. So I need to, to implement more like the caching and stuff like that. Okay. Um, uh, just a quick question to Scott. Yeah. Scott, uh, Scott where, where are the events finally resting? Is it, so is there a messaging system behind the implementation of this POC? No. No. No, there, it's, all, it's all just um, fire and forget. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is where I might- I, I wanted to so. reduce the number of dependencies on this. Mm -hmm. In my implementation, the config does ship it out to a Knative service. My thinking is that I'm going to set the uh, the scale to min one, and then you know um, maybe make it live for like 15 minutes or something, and then when no one's touching the demo, it, it goes away and resets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what else do we need to talk about then here? I mean, I assume the biggest hurdle for at least, for, well, actually not a hurdle, but Scott and Remy, it seems like you guys need to make yourself available on the internet so people can talk to it. Yeah, that's what we'll do. I'm, I'm not, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if we wanted to register some <clears throat> so scott let's say i wanted to take your services and register them into my discovery endpoint is is that something that is possible and we should do that way i can add more stuff and test out to make sure your subscription manager can 
can be hooked up to my discovery endpoint that I can then subscribe to it without having to go through your discovery endpoint? Yeah, I might have to add like a, some sort of helper page to help you register your, your service into my discovery service if you want to be aggregated into it. And that might be interesting. Uh, on my side, like uh, with the UI I've shown you, if I make it available uh, online, and I just add you the plus, then you can do plus, and then you create, you put the URL of your service, and then automatically it will be available on the UI. And you can also click on the gateway and ask it to connect and do like, so it's really just adding a button on my side. And I can put it, if I put it online, then we can all play around with it. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, there is no authentication and we will all share the same uh, UI <laughs> because under the hood, it's the same uh, service uh, unless I manage session on it. So I, can, help. I, I would need to implement some sort of API that your UI could call. Yeah, that's already what I did. No, like, but like on my UI, basically what I will say is if I send, let me, if your service uh, stays at uh, like scott.com, uh, then I will put scott.com into the UI. It will ask my API to do a discovery at scott.com slash services. From that, it will get your all your services. And when you click subscribe, you will use a subscription URL to subscribe to it. And then it will display automatically. Yeah, but you're not going to get my update events because you're you're being the aggregator for me. And I, what I want to show is you can register random registry services. But I will get the, why do you say I won't get, uh, because for now it's just a proxy. So every time I ask to the gateway, it will ask you and you will just proxy the call. Right, but, but uh, so I need these downstream services or upstream services to be able to register into the my discovery endpoint because it itself is an aggregator. Okay, well like uh, I can put the two other service like the ping service and uh, so we can all uh, display our ping services and uh, our, uh, like for me it was a cat, but uh, yeah, I can continue with this one. And the thing is those service as like a small discovery and an endpoint, they already have everything. For me, they are ready to go those ones. They manage subscriptions and uh, and discovery. So you can connect to them. So you could, uh, on your side, add them to your discovery on, on your service. Once mine are online, you can probably try to reach to them and add them to to yours. Oh yeah, I see. Yes, I I need to implement that piece because it's it's dynamic, but only through a config. Because and then what I was thinking is just to put the UI to be accessible for everyone. So this way you don't have to rebuild it. You can just use it because the UI is just, uh, if I reach, basically it uh, proxies a discovery, it proxy also. So it allows you to, in one UI, uh, it's kind of a client for the discovery and, uh, and the subscription. But Remy, you, um, you just do a simple get to the discovery endpoint to grab list of services and to aggregate, right? Yeah, when I aggregate, it's uh, it, if I so the aggregation, so what I call the gateway, will do the get on all the different uh, services that it knows to get all the the source and display the. It will call the slash service on each proxy, and then aggregate them into one view. Right, and you 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 periodically do a a reget to get the updated list, right? For now, what I do, like I didn't cache it, and it's basically if the client, so the web browser is asking to discover, then it will redo the, it will launch 10 requests in the background and answer with one. Okay. So I don't, there is no cache, so there is no interest of, uh, it's always up to date because I'm always asking to the final service, what his discovery is. Got it. Okay, cool. Okay. All right. Um, I think well, that's probably enough for today. I think once we get our various discovery endpoints up there, people can actually start hitting them and playing with them. Um, I'm sure we'll need to get back together and complain about each other's implementation choices. <laughs> uh, for me, it's really more the subscription API. Well, I was, uh, 
My, my two biggest, uh, I would say, issue is the subscription API. We need to validate the new version that we probably both implement alike, but to make sure that we have exactly the same now. And uh, the second is the SDK, the JavaScript SDK, uh, because I think I should uh, push back some of the modification I did inside the SDK but I would like to have more uh, an architectural uh, discussion with the SDK people on that because I don't want to change code without them uh, agreeing with the philosophy. <laughs> okay. okay. Do we last need... question. Sorry. Yeah, go uh, no, go ahead. Do we, do we have the receiver implementation in the SDK already for discovery and subscription API? No, I had to build it. Yeah, same. And I that's why I'd like to push it back. I had a PR on the SDK, the JavaScript SDK for the discovery service, uh, but it's still... Uh, and in fact, while doing the full implementation, like with the dependency with subscription API, I think there's something to discuss there. On how yeah, I mean, because I was wondering that once we are done with the POC, that's where we start creating tasks in the SDK where we create the receiver implementations for all the relevant SDKs, right? Wait, wait, can, 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 I'm sorry, you guys are, you lost me. When you say receiver, what do you mean by receiver? So, I mean, basically you would have something by the end of the project, we would have something like, let's say a subscription API listener receiver or subscription API receiver. So you don't have to implement your own, uh, uh, on receiver for the subscription API, it should have been offered by the SDK out of the box. Okay, wait, wait, I, I, I apologize. I'm being really dense. But when, when you say a receiver for the subscription API, do you mean an implementation of the subscription manager or do you mean a sync to get events? Uh, no, basically, so it's, it's a registration endpoint where you simply start a server and then the user of the SDK registers their functions. Like what if you receive a GET request? or if you receive a get request for subscription or a create subscription request and stuff like that, right? And in that way, so basically we wanted to abstract some of these uh, HTTP protocol specific uh, boilerplate into the SDK. That's what I'm assuming that we would head on down the line. Okay, so you're talking about a subscription manager SDK kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so good. like okay. something what we have a cloud event receiver as of today, we would have something similar for the subscription API as well as for the discovery uh, endpoint. So in that way, that we try to isolate as much boilerplate as possible into the SDK itself. Down the Understood. Line. Okay, got it. Cool. Yeah, another thing I did implement was, uh, was just like a, a simple security check on my side. Like when I subscribe, I uh, already had like a header with like a secret. And when I receive the event, I verify that that secret is uh, is the one I sent before. Like when I subscribe, because. Yeah, I know that we try to keep the security aside, the spec, but uh, maybe it's because uh, I work in security field. But, <laughs> <laughs> well, but I right. think, but I think that'd be an interesting use case for that stuff that we talked a little bit about on the phone call last Thursday, right? Which is in the subscription API spec, it talks about certain headers that you can ask to be sent or echoed back to you. On, on yeah, the, that's events, exactly what I right? use. Yeah. yeah, so I so use that'd be that. a good test. Okay. Um, okay. Is there anything else you guys think we need to talk about? Because um, it sounds like people just need to go off and finish up their implementations, add their metadata, for lack of a better phrase, to this web page or to this Google Doc. And then I think this week's call is a discovery um, call after the usual one. So we can continue the discussions there. Um, obviously, if we have any issues we want to bring up, we can use the Slack channel. Yeah. Uh, anything else you guys want to talk about uh, right now? Uh, no, I think it's good. If someone can yeah. review the API I have on the, on the subscription API, uh, it would be great. OK. All right. Nice. If you could drop the PR in the channel, that's the cloud in channel, but we can have a look. How's your implementation going, Doug? I have um, I have a lot of the same thing you guys do, obviously. Um, I have a little test client that allows me to do subscribes and stuff. I need to, the biggest thing for me, I think, is just to make it available on the internet, which I have not done yet. 
Um, oh, and I don't do have that. filtering. I need, I need to add filtering support. But most of the other stuff I think is there. I just it's just not in a demoable demoable form. Oh, oh I, think, uh, I didn't realize you have to make it available over the internet. <laughs> well, well, something has to be available, right, for us to be able to talk to you one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> what was the change around uh, the filters array and then the inner filter yeah. array? Oh, okay. Yeah, here, let me see what you guys think. Because I... Where is it? Um, where's my PR? Yeah, that's why I didn't rush the filtering part because I was like, I think it's moving. <laughs> so. Yeah, so here. So... Because I wonder oh, if I just ignored what's what's in the spec, but I don't I don't think I did. Okay, so to me, I think the discovery endpoint filters array should look like this, where it's an array of filters, where each filter expression you can specify a dialect, and then the type, and then property you want to assert or compare and the value you want to compare. This okay. this is much, much harder to implement in a language like Go. Is it because these properties are dynamic? Yeah. How else could we do it to make it easier in Go? The way it was. The way it was. Um, hold on. Let's go back to the way it was. Doo -doo -doo -doo. So the way it was, was this. I'm not sure I see a difference. I think this example was wrong. It's supposed to be filter at the top, just with a no S. Right. And then inside that is an object that says dialect and then filters. Yeah, but the filters was still dynamic based upon the dialect. Yeah, that's that's okay. I can understand how to marshal an object internally into it. If I can marshal the whole thing at once, and based on dialect, that's Oh, are you saying, yeah, okay, let me back up. You're, I think, suggesting that I made life harder by moving dialect inside of it. Yeah, because in the class, he's not. Uh... But see, the problem that I had with it is that what that means is I can't do multiple, I can't do multiple dialects in one subscription. Yeah, don't do that. Well, why? Why do you want to do that? Because oh, I, be, yeah. because because if if as a subscriber I support multiple dialects, why should I not allow somebody to use them all at the same time? Yeah, I do agree with you. Dude. I'm sorry for go, but yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry for go. <laughs> That's the entire reason I moved it in there, Scott, was because it made no sense to me to say if I support five of them, but you can only use one at a time. That seems silly. The only thing is uh, just uh, if we do the JSON schema, basically a filter is defined by a dialect and all the property depend of the dialect, correct? Like, because if I create my own dialect, like let's say French, uh, <laughs> like maybe it's not gonna be type property and value, but something completely different, correct? That was my assumption as well, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, I'm aligned uh, with you. The, the, also, last, last week, there was uh, someone saying, and I, I find it uh, interesting that it's really hard to filter on the to limit on the number of filters while filtering can be compute intensive and it was easier for him to put a limit on the number of subscription and so he wanted to have only one filter capabilities or like to find a way to to avoid someone sending you uh, like 100 filters inside yeah. one subscription does it say if the filters are an and or an or? It says an and. It specifically says and. Yeah, if it's an and, uh, that's kind of... Uh, stuff yeah, I, I moved the text around, but this is basically the text right in, in here. Yeah, so I mean, if you put 100 conditions, that means at the end you are not selecting anything. Well, so I think it makes sense for maybe the, the discovery endpoint metadata to say, if there's a limit to the number of filters, you can specify per subscription. Right. That way, someone, that way, a discovery endpoint could say, "Hey, this this is this subscription manager only supports one filter per subscription." Yeah, and leave it to the implementation. Yeah, I think you're right. It's better. Does it say anything about the the filters yet? It don't doesn't look like it. What do you mean about think. the filters? Like what what dialects do the 
do, which filter dialects does it support and things like that? Well, yeah, according to what Clemens wrote, it says you must support the basic one. Right, but how do you know if you can use other ones? So there's, okay, that's actually something else. Um, here, uh, wait, where was it? I added some, wait, did I do it in a different PR? I, I thought I added something so that someone could discover the list of dialects, hold on. No, maybe I put it in the same PR. Oh yeah, yeah here, I created, I created a subscription dialects entry Oh, or a field in the discovery thing. I would just call it dialects. Uh, we could. I don't care about the name that much. I was just trying to be consistent. But yeah, we can call it dialects. Actually, that would make It's fun. almost like we should have an object that is called subscription with URL, dialects, and uh, config ID, I would say. Because the more we add, uh, it stopped becoming ugly. Yeah. We can definitely talk about that. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, big as well. Say it again, Scott? Yes. Subscription URL, subscription config, subscription data. Yeah. Protocols, which is also a subscription, but it didn't get grouped. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's something. Yeah, you're right. I forgot about that. But yeah, the protocol is basically the subscription service who can say which protocol it. Yeah, we can definitely switch all that up. But cleaning up is always good. Okay. Um, the spec version also, there is one thing is if we have 0 0.3 and 1.0, what does that mean? It's when you're subscribed, you should ask which format you want. Yes. Part of the subscription. Yeah, I think too, yeah. I think, um, actually, we have a... Trying to remember, hold on. <laughs> so I have a hard stop in three minutes, but I think it's really super helpful for me at least to participate in those calls. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Uh, hold on. I wish he had a sample subscribe message someplace. I don't think he does. Uh, in the subscription? No, there was a. But like this one is complete. It's not. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I put it in the bottom. <laughs> Yeah, so here's what a subscribe looks like, I think. Uh, yeah, it looks something like that. Yeah, but notice there's no, maybe I, maybe I messed up, but there's no um, spec version in there. No, you know about that, and we need to put it. <laughs> I, it might be okay because the if the sender sends, it should be doing the, the options negotiation, and, and it shouldn't be in the subscription, I think. What do you mean by that? Uh, when it this, when the subscription service makes the initial post, it should be asking, uh, you know, what spec version it wants. And so if it's it tries to send version one and that doesn't work, it might fall back to something that is supported. Yeah, that's why for me, it would, it would be nice to be in the subscription. So this way I don't have to fall back because if I generate 1 million event and I fall back every time on 1 million event, if I'm not smart, it's... So what happens when you want to upgrade to the next version, but all your subscriptions are locked into the old one? Uh, you put a subscription. You just update the subscription to say, now I want the V1. And on your endpoint, the sync is basically managing two, the two version now. No? Or you resubscribe depending on your case. Yeah. Ah, I think we're getting kicked out. Yeah. Okay. Later. Okay. We'll talk to you. We'll talk to you guys. Uh, we'll talk to you guys again on Thursday or through the Slack channel. Bon appétit, Doug. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.
Hello, hello. Hi. Is this for the server serverless uh, work group? Yes, exactly. Uh, is it Nicola? Could you? Sorry, I had to stop Google uh, Google Home. Yes, my name is Nicola. So I'm uh, mostly just interested to attend out of curiosity. So I'm not going to be very okay, much. Okay, great. Uh, welcome to the call. And do you want to appear on the attendees list? Uh, with, uh, yeah. Uh, do you want to be associated with a company? It's free to, so. No, no. To. Okay. I'm doing this on a personal basis, unpaid time. Yeah, I think there is a holiday in a lot of countries, so I don't know how many people are actually going to join today. Like I know in Brazil there's holidays, so maybe Ricardo won't be here. Mm -hmm. How many more. people usually attend the meeting? Mm, we have a pretty small community. We have about between five and maybe ten people typically in the call. But we just changed the weekly calls as well. So okay. I'm from Montreal, uh, Canada. Oh, very nice. Oops, was on mute. And we have Falco. Hi, Falco. Hey, guys. So, yeah, this is the uh, first time uh, that we switched to our weekly calls. And two weeks ago, we had an additional one. Last week was the regular bi weekly. And um, the CNCF calendar was updated. I also sent out a note in our Slack channel. And I sent an updated invite to the serverless working group uh, email list. So let's see if people already have it on their calendar, um, as we discussed last week. But we also have a few low hanging fruits, I think, for the PRs. Yeah, I'll just ping over. Well, so we have, uh, sorry, uh, so we have David. Uh, hi, David. Wow, lots of new names. It's great. David, can you hear me? Or Malik? Hello, Malik. This is Malik. Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Do you want to be associated with a company? Yes, I'm uh, from American Express, actually. Yes, sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm trying again, David. David, can you hear me? Hey, and we have Jürgen. Hi. Hi, hey guys. Okay, then uh, I think we can start. I'm not sure if, uh, Jürgen, do you know if Kay wanted to join today? I will ping him and see. Okay, but uh, I think we can start. So the whole call, let's start with the, oh, we have one more, wow. Hello, uh, Karina. I think you were first. Uh, no, she's not connected yet. Maybe now, Karina, can you hear me? Hello, yes, I can hear you. Hi. Hi, is this your first time on serverless workflows? Yes, correct. Uh, Tehumi mm. invited me to the meetings, so right. thank you for having me. Okay, and is it correct that you are with Red Hat? Yes, correct. Okay, thank you. 
And we have Hong Ki again. Hi, welcome back. Uh, hi. <laughs> Okay, trying David one more time. David, can you hear me? No? Okay, let's start. Uh, so roll call with uh, community questions. Are there any questions to the community, to the group? No, okay. Then let's get to our first topic. Uh, so we've been discussing a release plan for quite some time and we wanted to make at least one bump in the release because a lot has happened and we haven't put out a new release and we wanted to get one before KubeCon. Now um, we already wanted to freeze uh, the current version and work on uh, bug fixes last week but um, I think we, we have to get to it now because there are only two more weeks left to um, KubeCon. And we initially we wanted to do a 1.0, but a lot of issues have come up and there is a, a little bit of work going on uh, that was also pushing out uh, critical fixes that we wanted to do for the retries and the error handling. So um, the idea was maybe to do a version that is not yet a 1.0, but uh, something below. The next logical one would be 0.2, but I also feel that uh, too much has happened. Um, we could go higher. Uh, I think last week we had a suggestion to use 0.9. I am I'm really not, it, we really just want to signal that we have a new version. Uh, so I'm opening the mic for suggestions. So is, is the question just uh, which version, which number? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Wait. we had a discussion, I don't want to put any. Yeah. Okay. So, so something between zero point one and less than one point zero. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, zero point two sounds fine to me. Does signal new version, uh, but I also get the. Uh, the part about showing that there's been a lot of improvement or a lot of new, a lot of change. Um, 0 0.5 might be a candidate. That's funny. I just mentioned that same number to Teomir on the chat uh, on Slack. <laughs> and uh, Teomir also made a suggestion that maybe we could do a release candidate. Um, personally, I'm in favor of really doing an actual release and then uh, working towards 1.0 after KubeCon. Yeah, so 0.5? Same, same for me as well. Uh, uh, like an actual number more than a release candidate. OK. So Tiermia, um, would you be OK with that? 0.5? Yeah, Does it sound good? Yeah. yeah, if everybody's OK with that, definitely. And I can then. Start creating the branch and 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 uh, once we go through the PRs, we can the, the ones mentioned here. We can just do a freeze until this work is done and then move on. Um, also in the roadmap as well. Perfect. Um, okay, last chance for objections. Okay, then point five it is. Um, and. Also, we've been postponing a demo on how to use open API function definitions uh, for two weeks now. And uh, today would be a good time to have it. Uh, Tiumia, how long should we schedule for that? Is it 15 minutes or? Uh, if I can have maybe about 20, last 20 minutes, I'll be happy with that. Sure, okay, great. Okay with you guys um, for today's talk. Okay, I have to stop sharing, right? <laughs> We've been there last week. Oh, do you want me to like do it now or you want to go through the PR? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Let me just see. If you're ready. Uh, uh, or uh, if, if you need more time, then let me no, do the no, PR. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, I'll share my screen and let me just open up some slides that I have. Um, one second. 
Uh, I think I have it going on. All right, it doesn't matter. So I I share my screen. Share. All right, you guys see my screen somehow? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Um, I I really would like for this to be some sort of interactive type of talk. I don't want to be a monologue and. If I talk too much, which I sometimes tend to do, uh, please stop me and tell me that I, that I talk too much. <laughs> but anyways, so uh, what I wanted to show recently, basically for people that are new here, uh, serverless workflow uh, defines, and I'll show this language, I mean, the slide here. What we show, when we define serverless workflow, what it is, we really define a declarative and a domain specific language. Uh, workflow language. Declarative as it's not represented in code or if else statements or low level code blocks, uh, but it is expressed in JSON YAML format and domain specific language as in our target domain it is workflow orchestration of event driven distributed services. And the reason why I say that is when we see a look at workflows and what they do and the using orchestrating uh, things using workflows, we really have to understand our domain which is a lot of times governed by our architecture and things like that, and also see how this language really fits uh, to translate or to express uh, the control flow logic and the whole workflow language in that particular domain. So recently what we uh, made a change is basically uh, uh, introduce that we're really uh, specification and standards based for events. Uh, we define them using the cloud event specifications, and then we also made a recent change for function definitions or the definition that tell the runtime implementations how to execute or invoke distributed services during workflow execution. And we moved that to uh, offloaded our any sort of possibility to find some custom parameters, use some language that is not really appropriate to our domain or really be, carry on some custom definitions. The long run, long, long run will just mean maintenance to the open API specification, which is 100 times better suited for defining invocation of RESTful services that we ever could do in our language uh, on our own. So I wanted to show a little demo. In this demo, we will code a process together. And I think a process, a workflow together. And I thought this would, uh, start some discussion material and also kind of let you guys see some things about the workflow other than just looking at uh, the specification and reading the documents and staring at the examples. So is this something, I just want to, before I continue, is this something okay to do right now or you guys find this boring and you don't want to look at it at all? Uh, I speak now. I mean, I, I'm interested. All right, so just to show you guys, uh, this uh, thing is, okay, so what I'm going to describe to you guys is a use case, all right? So the use case that we're looking at is in this particular demo patient onboarding, for example, in a hospital system. So you're dealing with registering a new patient to assist and assigning doctor to a patient based on their conditions and also scheduling uh, appointment for that particular patient with the doctor that was assigned to it. It's a very small use case, use case of course, in real world scenarios you would have a lot more <laughs> rules and, 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 and the business logic would be more complex, but for, for this 20 minutes, this is good enough. Uh, since we said that a serverless workflow is really a domain specific language, we have to look at now, what is the architecture of our applications and see how workflows can fit in to actually orchestrate to solve the business problem on patient or onboarding. So. In this slide, you will see that in the application that I will show you uh, that will start soon is that we have three services running. They can be completely distributed, but the way I have it, I'm, I have a lot of issues with internet, so I'm, I'm running them locally right now, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, we have three patient uh, services, and we have to orchestrate them in order to uh, uh, solve our business problem. On the bottom, you will see that in a lot of cases, we have different triggers or applications or services which need to invoke uh, this orchestration process. That can be, as we'll see also in the demo, web UIs, or there can be some particular devices uh, that might be used in a hospital or other than web UIs where you enter in new patient information to trigger onboarding. 
Uh, the way we're going to do it in this demo is we're going to, through different UIs or different devices, uh, push cloud events to a message broker. In this demo, I use MQTT, uh, Mosquito, but you can use Kafka, whatever the heck you want to really do. Now, our workflow, the way we define it is can be either triggered and we will see as a service, so it has a RESTful endpoint, but we really want to be defining our workflow language that we're going to listen to this new patient cloud event, which is going to trigger our workflow execution and then orchestrate the services that we have available in our system. So that's kind of like what it is. And um, I'm just going to go, I don't know from yet, I'm going to go ahead and just start my application. It doesn't have any workflows defined yet. Oh, well, um, hold on. I forgot to do something real quick. One sec. And while this is running, I have this on a branch. Uh, we're going to look at uh, VS Code. Now in VS Code, I have a simple Maven project. And this is currently what we're going to do is run it on uh, Quarkus. You can also run it on Spring Boot or Micronaut or whatever. It's a Java based runtime currently that uh, I've been working on to, to add the, the, the implementation or the runtime implementation for our serverless workflow language. And one important thing when you start working in VS Code is uh, I would urge you to go to the extensions and type in serverless workflow. And in this case, you will see the first one is our extension. This is the extension that we provide and it's in our GitHub repository. And it gives you things like code hints, code snippets. It lets you generate an SVG diagram for both JSON or YAML uh, formats and things like that. So this is kind of a must to have, especially if you're looking at uh, coding in VS Code. Um, so let's, let me see if this is completed real quick. Yep, so now I can probably start my app. Sorry about that. I wasn't prepared really. So anyways, this should just take a sec. All right. So I think we started it. All right, so what the first thing I want to show you is the Swagger UI of our application. And just like we showed on this particular slide, we have the three services, we have them here. Uh, the endpoint of our patient service is slash patients, the endpoint of our doctor service is slash doctors, and the appointment service is under slash appointment. That's the endpoints of these particular services. I don't have any workflows. I don't have any orchestration. So that's what we're gonna do together. This new patient event service, it's just a little service that from web UI, you can hit it, give it new patient information. It's gonna create a cloud event and push it onto uh, an MQTT top. So anyway, so let's go back to our, um, Jesus, I can't, all right, VS Code. And since this is the Maven project, because this is a Java runtime, if, if we ever end up having runtimes in different languages, this could be a different project structure. But they're under source main resources, uh, we're going to create, let me delete this SVG real quick. We're going to create a new workflow and let's call it onboarding uh, workflow. And we're gonna use JSON now. And let's go ahead and start. Now, when you start using uh, this in VS Code and get our extension, you'll see you're gonna get code completions, right? And it's going to show us first the top level uh, parameters that we can use for our workflow. So let's give our uh, workflow unique ID. Let's call it onboarding. We can give it a name. Let's say onboarding workflow. And at this point, we can start doing our control flow logic. So let's take a look at that. The way we uh, define control flow logic in serverless workflow language is basically a number of states. Each state does particular control flow logic assignment or piece uh, that it's responsible for and then transitions between those states. So let's go ahead and define our states for our orchestration. Uh, let's give a, a state a name. So we have, let's say, uh, let's onboard state and each state has a type. Now you will see that currently in our specification, we have nine different types. 
and each one again irresponsible will do some piece of control for logic that that it, 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 it's assigned to do since in our uh onboarding business requirement we have to wait on an event or new patient event we're going to use an event state so once you define a type the extension is going to give you the parameters that are associated with that particular type so you're not going to get parameters for different types of states so in our case uh we are looking for a parameter called on events this parameter really means that okay we define the events that we want to uh wait for and then the actions they're going to be executed once we receive this particular event so in this case we have uh an event ref let's call it new patient event all right and then what we only have one now you here you can define multiple you can define joins and, and things like that, whether multiple events can arrive together, if you need more than one, if you just want to act on one, uh, 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 the actions are associated with singular event, and this is what the case is. And we define actions. The actions in our case are really invocations of our distributed service or the three services that we have available in our demo. So for that, let's define our function reference, and we're going to give it a reference name. So this is the first. So the first uh, uh, service that we want to invoke, we can give it a, a name, let's say, add new patient to system. And if you see so far, this is all logical names. These are dom domain specific description of our services that make sense to your domain uh, at your company or your projects that you're using. There is nothing special uh, here. So now we want to, I have two more. And since for onboarding, I have to first add a patient, then design a doctor, and then um, schedule the next appointment, we need to execute these functions in sequentially. But you can also in this action say that you want to execute actions in parallel as well. So the next one we want to execute is like say, assign doctor to patient. All right, so we got that. And the third one we say, we say schedule patient appointment. And this is really it. With one single state where we're able to describe all of the control flow logic, we're waiting for the particular new patient event and we want to execute the three or invoke the three services sequentially. The only other thing we have defined in our language is we have to tell the workflow which state is the starting state and which state is the ending state as far as ending workflow execution. So we just, since in this case, we only have one state, um, oops. Uh, we want to, there are different ways of starting workflows. There is a scheduled way and, and Jurgen knows a lot about that. He'll help us with that. But in this case, since we're waiting an event, we just have a default start. And on the bottom, for example, we can define that this state also ends uh, workflow execution. And again, let me show you this too, so if you're interested. We can uh, create an event when workflow execution ends. We can terminate all the threads, like if you have some parallel state running branches still in the background or different threads, everything will be killed. Or for us, once we perform the three actions or invocation of our services, we just want to end the workflow execution. And see, with like 30 lines of YAML code, we have defined this, or I mean, JSON code in YAML would be less. The only other thing now is that we have to find the control flow logic. We have to give our runtimes a little bit more information about the event, new patient event, and about the services that we want to invoke. So for that, what we have is for events, we have an events array. And this contains our event definition. Now, right now we're defining them in line, but the language itself defines also that this can be a string type where you can offload, you can define your events and and function definitions and separate files and reference them here so they can be reused between multiple workflows, right? So in this case, what we're going to do, we're gonna give our one event a name. Now this has to match uh, the declarative or the domain specific name here. And at this point we use uh, cloud events context attribute. So we have a type attribute that has to match the type of the cloud events format of the event that comes in. So let's say we call it new patient events, for example, type. And we also want to have a source parameter. This is the parameter that defines who produces this particular uh, cloud event. And 
one cool thing that you can do, especially when you're using message brokers and stuff like that, and we have in our requirements, uh, uh, we have described if we want to be able to receive events for multiple sources. So instead of defining this event five times, each one for each different device that we have, one thing that we can actually do is say new patient, which is our topic uh, for our message broker that will receive events. And we can just put a plus sign here. And this basically means that we want all the events on all their message broker topics there. Let's say we have the example of new patient slash web, new patient, patient slash device X, device Y, all of them is actually going to trigger our uh, instance of our workflow execution. So that's really it we, for our single event. This last thing we have to do is define our functions. Or the functions are tell the runtime a little bit more information on how to exe actually execute the three services that we want to invoke. So let's go ahead and define our first function. You guys stop me with any questions if you guys have any questions. Don't, you know, don't, I'll, I'll go off otherwise forever. So we have a first function definition and we talked about functions being, uh, we use the open API definition. So we have an operation def uh, parameter here. Now, if I go back to my web page, you will see that things like Quarkus and Micronaut and Swagger and things like that allow us to, we don't have to uh, hard code um, the open API definition. Sorry, I have to move, um, but it will be generated for us. So in a lot of these new types of architectures and, and things like that, you don't have to deal really with the overhead of uh, generating this open API stuff yourself. So what I have here is I also have the same thing in our um, project, but in JSON format. So I call it services those JSON. So what we want to do is in our operation parameter, give a URI. In this case, it's a relative path to our open API definition. So it's uh, API slash services.json. And then what we want to do is give it a unique identifier of the operation of this service that we want to invoke. So if you look at our open API definition, we see under slash patients, which is the first service, we have a post operation here that we want to invoke and it's operation ID is called add patients. So we're just going to, where's my workflow? All right, here. We just want to give it that. And that's really enough information for the runtime to know exactly what needs to be done in order to execute this particular function. So the only other thing I'm gonna do is create two more, one for, for this one and for this one, it's assigned doctor to patient. So it's, it's our doctor service. We look at the post method, assign doctor, that's that. And our third one uh, is our scheduled patient appointment service, which has to deal with, where is our appointments? The post method is schedule appointments. All right. And this is it. This is our workflow definition. There is nothing more to it. Now, one cool thing with uh, serverless workflow VS Code plugin, which you can do, is we can see if we can actually visualize this particular workflow. And right now, what we have done is we have generated an SVG diagram from our JSON definition. The same thing can be generated from YAML as well. And this looks very simple. It just uses a, a state UML diagram. We can see we have a single state and the border color you see in the legend, uh, it matches the type. And we see that the, our event state waits for a single event called new patient event. All right, so one thing I have to do now real quick, I'm sorry, since we added the workflow, I have to just restart uh, my app in order for it to get picked up. And this really only takes a couple seconds. Any questions so far? Yes. Yeah, one thing I noticed oh, is okay. the, oh, sorry, no, please go ahead. Yes, I, I have a question. Um, you apparently associating functions to, uh, to the different steps. I understand that. Now let's say that I'm, I'm uh, trying to improve my, my workflow. 
And um, as a result, I'm developing a new function. How would I, uh, and you know, obviously the function is already deployed and possibly running, and, but I would like to test my functions. So what, what would be the approach to do that? Do I need um, to, yeah. Well, it could be, in my opinion, multiple approaches. Uh, you could have uh, workflows are developed just like services. And I was going to show them as well. Workflows also have a version parameter, which I don't have here. You can version your processes, test different ones. And the cool thing about workflows or, uh, right now is they're not separate as, as your code. So just like you would test out your different version of a microservice that you deploy in Go or Python or whatever, mm -hmm. the workflows are really the same. Uh, the world of this monolith type of workflow deployments where you click a button and I don't know what happens is over. And I was going to show you guys actually that right now, I redeploy the application. And if we look at the Swagger UI right now, you will see we all of a sudden have an onboarding service. And if you look at our workflow definition, this is the unique ID of our workflow. So with this modern type of workflow orchestration is you really write your workflows within domain specific language rather than code, but you deploy them just like any microservice that anybody on your team would write and deploy. So your workflows themselves, even though they define some sort of a part of a solution to a business problem, or uh, it really then can be deployed as services and be used by other uh, parts of your teams that let's say, have onboarding is just a part of their business requirements, just like another service that you have deployed in your system. And I think that is really kind of like a very important feature right now of workflows, that there is really no separation between what we call a microservice written, let's say in code and deployed on a, on a container or a cloud platform or a you know, workflow. At the end, you really don't know, right? Okay, let, let me be a bit more specific. I understand what you're saying, and that makes sense. For example, there is a concept of uh, A-B testing when you deploy some new uh, version of a new container, right? So the way this is done, I mean, after you need to play with the routing of the queries, uh, uh, possibly here routing of events. Again, I don't know exactly how that would be done. Uh, uh, essentially, I would want to do some A-B testing, and I would say only my request or my events, so I don't know how to do that either. Maybe I have to create a different UI, I don't know. Uh, only my request should go to this particular workflow. And uh, the people that are currently using my infrastructure, they, they, still, they still should be using uh, the workflow that, uh, that is in place now, right? But only for the new workflow that I'm trying to develop myself because I'm the developers, uh, I want the, uh, the routing to be slightly different. Is this something that you can address at your level? It can be addressed possibly at, you know, uh, at, at yeah. other levels, but. Definitely one way that we're addressing this in this particular Java based runtime is via versions. So if, you, if I added a version here, oops, sorry. I'm typing standing up right now. Um, version. And you can write, let's say 1.0, this will be deployed under the endpoint would result in one, one underscore O slash onboarding. So you can have multiple versions of your workflow running. And also you can switch out per the language definition, the function and event definitions. So you can keep your control flow logic the same, but here, instead of having events, one thing you can do is say events and you can actually say source main resources abc.json or yaml so you can even switch those out one can be the events for your deployment system production what some can be also for your development or testing uh environments and of course the, <laughs> we are looking for contributions in this area as well uh because you seem to be an expert i think it would be really nice if you can look at what we have and see what kind of improvements we can make on the language level to make it easier for users to do exactly what you're describing it. Does that make sense? Yeah. But anyways, um, any other questions? Okay, this is Malik here. So you said, uh, what is the request and responses for this, this election? He understood like implicitly, Mario was specifying explicitly. I didn't understand the screen. 
Can the you... input input the input from event A to event B to event C. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good question. And and this is one cool thing about uh, serverless workflow is that you don't really have to if if you see my function definitions and also my event definition here, I don't really have any parameters defined, right? And this is because by default, each state holds its data. So what happens actually here is when we receive the new patient event, the payload of this new patient event is going to become the state data. Now, by default, through the specification, uh, if you execute functions, you pass it the entire state data. And this is what our workflow is actually doing. However, when you have a function uh, ref, you can define parameters explicitly. So here, if your function, let's say you know from your uh, open API definition takes in two or three or five parameters, you can, uh, let's say we could you also define it like this, right? And then you can give an expression, which is a JSON path expression uh, the query is your state data, or in this case, the payload of the new patient event, which became the state data. And I can just say, for example, dollar sign dash patient. So you can use expressions to find, define parameters as well. So what happens after each action execution, the results of this execution of a service will be then merged with the state data. And then the next function uh, execution is going to either receive the entire state data as, 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 as payload, or it will, you can again define your parameters yourself. But because the, for this demo, each service that I've defined can just take the entire state data as it comes from, from the new patient event, uh, I don't have to define anything. So okay. yeah, yeah. Does, does that help? Oh yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Sounds good. No, yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. So just, just to end this demo, I'm sorry, I'm probably taking way too long. Uh, now let's actually see if we can run this demo. Uh, here I have a very simple UI, it just has a form. It's a, where you enter in, let's say somebody working at a hospital, a new patient, we can say his name is, let's say Michael. And this guy unfortunately has breathing problems. Now, when I click on here, we're going to hit create a cloud event. The cloud event is going to be set on our new patient slash from web um, topic, MQTT, and is going to trigger workflow instance. And let's see if this actually works. Whoops, why did I get two? I don't know right now, but it doesn't matter. So we'll see we onboarded on Michael. He has breathing problems. I think I clicked it twice, sorry. And so this is our first execution of our first service or patient service with our workflow, the store the patient or system. This guy, this, uh, oh, the appointment service didn't really work. This, I don't know what's going on right now, but anyways, and we didn't really get a call from the third service, but I don't know this worked last night and I'm getting some. Uh, I think uh, also your, your workflow definition, the function re reference, uh, uh, should be there's a table here there in the, in yeah. the function reference. See the first one, it's assigned doctor to patient, but there's a uh, uh, is that right? It, it, Which line? Uh, the, uh, yeah, the line line 43 assigned doctor, but uh, the operation is uh, add patient. Is that right? Oh, no, the, 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 this just matches this guy right here uh they seem to be out of order yeah it doesn't mean doesn't matter but this actually worked i can just check it assign this is bad now schedule appointment let me just see add patient or is it add patients should the add a new patient to system uh, the operation is uh yeah the functions and the operations are mixed up i think which line uh, that should be a sign doctor and line 48 should oh, be. Oh, sorry. That's why our third one wasn't called. Yes. Thank you guys so much. I apologize. So uh, this is correct yeah. now. 
Yeah. Thank you, guys. Sorry. So let's just go ahead and restart this guy and actually run the demo correctly. Thank you, guys. Are you storing this data in anywhere in the database? Uh, right now, no, but you can for the simple demo. I just have um, in in memory. Okay. In memory, I have an application scope class that stores all this stuff in there. So yeah, yeah. just a demo. So let's go ahead and do this again. So let's go, <laughs> Michael, and he has uh, breathing problems. Woohoo, there we go. So we successfully executed our three services in sequential order as per our workflow control flow logic. And the only last thing I want to show is the other devices. So here I have a Mosquito. I'm going to publish directly to Mosquito Topic new patients from client. And we have a patient of name new patient from client to make sure it comes from here. And he has a condition of irregular heartbeat. So when I send this directly, this will be converted to a cloud event and should trigger also our workflow instance. So let's see if you actually did it. If I refresh this page and it seemed it didn't. Oh, I have something wrong. Didn't even send it. All right, let's try here with the, yeah, there you go. So now if we send it, all right, here we go. So we triggered our uh, new workflow instance. We had this event directly that was pushed into the uh, MQTT topic, and here is our new patient. He was assigned to some general physician, and the scheduling service scheduled him for the next appointment. So, uh, yeah, Jimmy, guys, one, one question about the um, so you copied the Swagger UI into your local pass, and you're referring to that file locally, but typically the open API spec would be hosted, right? Yeah, yeah. So when you have subsystems uh, exposing API functions, how how typically is it to have um, this Swagger UI definition with with a hosted service? Uh, you mentioned, or what do you what are you using to generate that information internally? Uh, okay, sure. So what I showed you guys earlier, um, we have uh, the new kind of like things like Quarkus and Spring Boot and things like that. Once you deploy your services a lot of these things generate the Swagger definition or the Open API definition for you. So not only can it ge generate you the Open API or the Swagger UI so you can visually see what's going on, you can also hit an endpoint called Open API and you see it just downloaded a file for me and here is it is. So this is the same thing that I have locally in my project. Uh, but this is uh, YAML. So in my workflow, I could have reference instead of saying API slash services does JSON, I could have actually had a full path to my open API endpoint. You see? So at that point, the runtime implementation would get the YAML open API definition. Uh, parse it and know how to execute or invoke this particular uh, and particular operation on the service. Does that help? Yeah, I think that was also um, uh, the the reason why we wanted to uh, also have this demo, right? It should motivate um, that the use of Open API is not that difficult. Um, I don't know. Do you think we should? reference or endorse any of the library's tools? Or is, is this a, a Swagger IO library that you're using? Yeah, OpenAPI has a bunch of different tools for many different languages. Uh, since I have this Java project, I'm just using the built-in stuff that Quarkus has for me. I'm not adding anything special. So I'm just using the Quarkus uh, OpenAPI um, extensions and basically everything built in. Spring Boot really has the same stuff. And I'm sure if you're not even in the Java space, but you're using like a Node.js or, or, or Go or whatever, <laughs> OpenAPI has a lot of stuff for that too. Um, I'm not familiar with the tools and everything on every language, but um, 
I've kind of like been around like Java for too long to 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 do a demo in something else at this point. Okay, cool. Thanks so much for the demo. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah, that was a cool demo. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I just have one question, which maybe is beyond uh, what you presented. But for example, for monitoring the uh, the workflow, uh, the workflow engine, right? Uh, for example, I want to know where my events are, in which state they are, and I've possibly have some metrics about, you know, how much time it takes to go from state one to state two to state three. Do you have tools that you recommend to do that? Or, um, um, no, but one thing that the serverless workflow language defines is a set of extensions. If you go to our GitHub repository and go to the specification project, you will see a directory called extensions. And the idea is, is that the way we want to define those is uh, as extensions to the, to, the, to the language itself. And currently you will find an extension called KPI, Key Performance Indicators, mm -hmm. uh, where you can enhance your workflow uh, information with information about expected versus actual uh, runtime results, such as cost and performance and times and things like that. Um, we are also working on a tracing extension currently. Uh, so, you know, we're very dependent on the community, you know, so mm -hmm. any help on any of that uh, would be huge, you know, from you guys. If you want to get involved, just ping us on, on, on the Slack channel, and I would love to work with anybody. On, on, on when you mean Slack. tracing, you mean tracing, uh, you know, like uh, Jaeger type of tracing, or are you talking exactly, about? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Because here we, we are talking about events, right? Monitoring events. I mean, that's what that that was what my question was about. Tracing is one problem in itself, and uh, some people have solved it, but maybe you know there's still a lot of work to be done. I agree with that. Um, uh, here, I'm talking about I want to have visualization of my events and see you know what's happening in my workflow, specifically on the workflow, right? Yeah, but I mean, I'm sure that if we define an extension that is uh, that is very kind of like defines a, a general structure of of defining like what you want, were looking for and what your expected values are. Uh, I assume that you can use it with, with the, with the uh, services that you have available, let's say on Kubernetes or your, or your cloud platforms that actually per, uh, uh, allow you to, to, to obtain this information during runtime. And, and we're basically trying to work with them as well. We can define a service on our own. We just deal with a <laughs> workflow language but the set of extensions that we write should be able to be used in multiple container or, 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 or environments that you're running this in. Thanks again, Tiumi. I'm sorry, in the interest of time, I'd like to move on. If there are any more questions, please just contact Tiumi on the Slack channel or uh, open an issue if it's for the spec and so on. Okay, um, let me share my screen and get to the PRs. So we have uh, two very easy PRs, I believe. Um, one is fixing an image where the output of the, let me show it. Um, da -ba -ba -bum. Sorry, I think the output of a, a workflow example was listing a single, oh yeah, a single um, value in a single map instead of an array of maps. Because I think the input was three, uh, is it? Yeah. I think this is better. Okay. So input for this was an array of maps and the output then said it's just a single map, but it should have been an array with just one map inside. Um, yeah. Okay. And I think Tiume, you fixed it in the in the PR that is listed here, right? State data filter examples. Any objections to merging it? So approved. And the next one is an ambiguous JSON pass example. And let me check. So this one was uh, doing an evaluation to, I think, derive the is adult property and then do a 
transition based on that. Um, and the, let me show the fixed. I think if I show the changes, it's easier. Um, bum, 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 bum. Okay, yeah. So instead of this, it is changing to the condition uh, that is correctly uh, selecting elements. And then when that could a condition is not null, so anything would render the, con uh, as a result of this query would render the condition true. Uh, transition is fired is uh, better than this one. And yeah, okay. I hope everybody had enough time to review it. Uh, it was on for a while. Any objections to merging this? And also approved. The third one is a little bit, yeah, more. So I would have had a question to Lucas, who is not on the call today. Um, this is about uh, the conditions at the end of a state, uh, the transitions, the conditions for it. Oh, which one was it? Do you mean, okay. Uh, was it the switch state or was it conditions? Yeah, the at, switch uh, state, uh, our switch state switch can state. work for both database or event-based conditions. So the, the issue that uh, he, it was fixed here was that um, we didn't have in our language an ability to define uh, what to do or which transition or which condition to take uh, on a switch or if you want to think a gateway when there's two conditions that evaluate to true two or more so what we added is two ways number one is the uh, order based de decision so if you just have a number of conditions in order uh, uh, the the priority would be uh, uh, the uh, aligned with the ordering of the way you define the conditions and we also added the ability here via priority parameter to declaratively uh, define a priority specific, this same thing like what BPMN is doing really, um, but uh, to define a declarative order on each condition in order to, to, to uh, define what to do in cases when there is multiple conditions that are so my argument last week was that we use um, order in uh, many points in the specification. For example, the actions list uh, is an ordered list. And uh, this would not only apply to the switch state, I believe, but also then to transitions. And uh, I, I can't really find the use case because if we use priority numbers, we'd also have to clarify um, what happens if I have the same priority assigned to two transitions and they both fire. Um, yeah, this right. again would resolve to order. So I'm not sure why we would want priority to begin with, uh, but I'll ask that um, to Luca. In the, yeah, let's take wait it offline. on that one then and, and move it to next week if you want. And okay, then um, maybe we can cover one or two issues. Um, Especially those two, they are both old, the 125 and 135, because I think they're both going in the same direction. So the first one is from Tiomir to update the error handling section. I think error handling uh, includes also uh, what happens if call failed and whether this has to be retried, like a function call, uh, I meant, uh, like an action. And um, there was also a suggestion to move this, the retry definition, which is currently described in, as part of the event state to a general section on retries. And I think both are um, targeting more or less the same, that is tidying up the error handling and introducing a new um, section for it. Is that correct, Jürgen and Tiumia? Yeah, it's my fault. I've been on this for too long. And I I'll try to get it this week done before we cut the uh, release. But yeah, Jurgen has added a bunch of cool information and, and input to this. And and uh, the retry section right now, it's, it's kind of like exactly the same as what, for example, AWS provides. There is no more or less uh, that we do at this point. 
but with Jurgen's input, it has to change. We have to redefine like how we actually handle errors and retries, and, and especially associated with different timeouts in our language. I think currently it's not very well. It's ambiguous in some cases, so it's not a small task. So if anybody else wants to help with that, I'm all ears. Uh, so Timmy, do you think we should do this before branching out, or cherry pick from? The dev branch then for the version 0.5 because I think this is something we would want in version 0.5, right? I don't know. I think I think just um, yeah, I'm just talking about the, the PR separate error we'll handling several, section. Yeah, I think the PR will be so big that it might take weeks for us to <laughs> make a decision on it. But I think 0.5 could be going out with what we have currently, and this will be a change for maybe the next either. 1.0 or whatever we decide the next release would be. Just my opinion, but again, whatever we decide. Because another thing are the retries, so maximum attempts, interval attributes, and the exponential back off, uh, which I believe are very good suggestions, and we just need to work on PRs for that. But it would be good to branch out um, the, or do the reordering first, and then add it um, to a changed version of the spec description. Definitely seems like the we don't want to be having people modifying retry stuff while the document's being reorganized. Yeah. So it's either either fix the the second two on retries, or or do the updates to the organization of the document. Um, but one needs to happen before the other. And the 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 that second one, the proposal to remove the retry definition. Um, I just think it's confusing where it's at. So I don't know if that should be a a required a something required to fix before we cut a release. Um, whereas I I feel like the retries for max attempts and exponential back off those are something that would be nice to be in if if we were picking stuff to go into the into the next cut or not. We also added quickly these um, the uh, the jitter to uh, intervals right. So yeah. I think introducing those max attempts and interval attributes would also be a, an easy PR, right? I just don't want people to start work and then uh, get conflicting changes that have to be sorted out uh, in lengthy sessions. So exactly. yeah. I just want to make sure if we maybe want to uh, reorganize. To me, it sounded as if the, the retry definition in the event state really just has to be moved to a workflow error handling section. So to have it as a general section. And then later we can work on other error handling uh, apart from the retry stuff. But um, okay, let me see if I, let, let's take this offline. Um, and we definitely do the 0 0.5 uh, branch and freeze. And because this also is just reorganization, in my opinion. So it's really sort of a um, bug fixing for understanding, so people can re readability, right? And then the retries, max attempts, and double attributes, and exponential bank of would be uh, additional features. Uh, so then do this, let's do this shortly after. That makes sense. That's um, Manuel, I just, before yeah. we end, I just wanted to, since Karina is still here, I just wanted to kind of introduce you guys. Karina is from Red Hat. And, and one thing that we really need is like a lot of help on the community side of things for a project. And she's like a pro on that. So I would like to just say come thank on, you, Karina. <laughs> yeah, come on, you know you are. And just so that, you know, if we have ideas, and I'm sure Karina will have how to improve uh, just the overall community section uh, and how we, we interact with, with the community and try to get more exposure. She can help us there a lot. So just letting you guys know. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for the intro and call me in guys. And thanks for the demo today, Tihoi. It was great. Awesome. Welcome aboard. Uh, it's great to have you. Okay, and um, I think 
for the remaining so uniqueness constraint is also something that we have targeted with the correlation token, but uh, Jürgen, you, you made some good points here. And the action and events ref, we had an outcome that uh, we would want two separate PRs out of this, right? And then the research to add support to JSON patch schema is something that uh, Ricardo, who is not with us today, is, is um, working on. So this is definitely ongoing. And uh, this completes my list. Uh, sorry to rush through these. Uh, let's definitely follow up on this. Um, and we're out of time. Anyways, um, any other business? Anything pressing? No, okay. And then let me do a final roll call for the latecomers. Uh, Emmanuel, um, do you want to be associated with any company? I am actually surprisingly working at American Express and I see Malik, uh, Malik is here. Uh, I'm at American Express, yes. Okay, great, welcome. And David, um, can you hear me now? I can. Okay, great, great. Uh, I tried at the beginning of the call. You're with Adobe, right? You've been I, with um, us a couple I, I of weeks to, ago. Yeah, I just switched to my phone, so I was having some audio problems at the beginning. Okay, perfect. No, just making sure you're here. <laughs> All right. And Suban. Hey. Hey, do you want to be associated with any company? Yeah, I'll um, check. C H E G G. Like that? Yeah. Okay. Then thank you, everybody. And I hear you next week. I think we also have a Suban here, right? Yeah. yeah. Just oh, add oh sorry. I, I missed you. Bye. Have I missed anybody? No, I think that's complete. Yes. My can, you sh can you share the, a link to this uh, document? So. Of in the chat channel or something like that. Yeah. It's um, yeah. It's also in the uh, community calendar of the CNCF and in the meeting I invite I shared today. Okay. Yes. And on Slack, but here, there you go. Oh, dear me, you bit. Oh no, <laughs> I sent it to you. Gosh, here you go. Yep. That's thank the you. link. It's in the meeting invite. Otherwise, okay. I I have it as well. But yeah, thank you for the link. Cool, then thanks. Okay. Thank you everyone. Bye bye. Have a great day. Bye -bye. Cheers. Bye.